Good morning, my friends. I am Julia Miller. I'm the director and I'm the founder of Citywide Singles. I want to invite you to join me this morning for Tea Time and Prayer as I bring the Word of God to you from Psalms 91. We have been in a series about um, the protection of God. And I have somehow settled on verse 5 that gives us the 24-7 protection that says, You will not fear the arrows that... Uh, I'm sorry, let me start over again. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day. I just love this verse because, again, this provides us with protection at night, but also the arrows that fly by day. So I've been talking about the different arrows that fly by day. And I hope you guys can hear me. I had uh, bought a fancy little mic, and <laughs> some people could hear me and some people couldn't. So we're, we're back to uh, the basics here. <laughs> And I'm going to have to find a different mic. But this morning, I want to talk to you about the arrow of insecurity. Uh, so many of us have experienced this where we feel uh, a sense of insecurity. Sometimes it can be the, the littlest things that put us in that position of feeling insecure. Sometimes it's just the way somebody looks at you. Um, I know some, sometimes I've been accused of... Uh, giving somebody a dirty look. I didn't mean to, but I, I was thinking I was having a Mr. Magoo kind of moment. <laughs> and I was like, uh, my mind, my eyes were in a certain direction, and I guess it was in the direction of that person. <laughs> and I was just, my thoughts, I was lost in my thoughts. <laughs> and somehow I must have had a funny look on my face. <laughs> and the person who I w was looking in their direction interpreted that as me being mad or displeased with them. And that just goes to show you how the enemy tries to shoot arrows at us that look like something that maybe it's not. Um, and those pierce us and it makes us feel as though um, we're, we're somehow less than. It, like I said, it could be a look, it could be something that somebody said. Sometimes people say things and they hear it differently than what it came out of our mouth. That's why it's important to ask people, okay, I think what I heard you say and just repeat back to them which what you think you heard them say, and maybe in saying that they'll realize that's that's not what I meant. Um, yeah, I guess that is what I said, but that's definitely not what I meant. So here's what I want to talk about today is knowing our enemy. And the enemy uh, of our soul really does try to shoot these arrows at us, and one of them is insecurity. Um, tomorrow I'm going to talk about the arrow of seduction, and so that will be on Saturday feel free to tune into that one but after that I'll go on to the next verse in Psalms 91 so I'm gonna say a quick prayer here and we'll get started father God we just thank you and we praise you father God that you cause your word to come to life for us father God as we meditate on your word we thank you and we praise you that you are ministering to our spirit in Jesus name Amen. Thank you so much for joining me this morning I love being able to share my, my prayer time with you um, we're talking about the arrow of insecurity, how the enemy can to try to shoot arrows at us and really um, the arrow of insecurity it's to me is one of the most painful uh, arrows of all because it really preys on our uh, make, making us feel rejected. It comes through rejection. A lot of times it comes through trauma. Some of us have been traumatized in one way or the other and we don't even realize it and when the enemy knows what your weak spot is, he knows how to just hit you with that arrow which puts us in a position of feeling insecure, but really, truly, this is rooted in a spirit, uh, an orphan spirit. And I'm gonna talk about this for just a few minutes because an orphan is, we know what an orphan is, it's really someone who feels like they never knew their parents or that their parents didn't want them. And the enemy, Satan, tries to get us to feel like God doesn't love us, that we are an orphan. And somehow we, we get this message that we're a servant, we're a slave working for God. That's an orphan mentality. You and I are children of God and we're heirs to the throne. We participate in God's divine promises and the things that he has for us. So really, I think that a lot of this can be solved in knowing who we are in Christ. But I wanna give you um, a, a quick real life example, but I also want to um, read you a story from 1 Samuel and tell you a story about, about someone who was robbed of their destiny because they really didn't, um, they weren't rooted and grounded in who God called them to be. 
So again, going back to the root of this orphan spirit, think about this. When Satan approached Jesus, the Son of God, he approaches him in the desert and he says, if you are the Son of God, and I've used this example before, but Jesus was in a time of fasting. He, was, he went into the, into the desert. He was about to start his ministry and he was led into the desert to fast for 40 days, okay? So think about this. The enemy tries to approach us when we're at a time uh, of weakness. So he, he's subduing his flesh. He's going into a time of fasting for 40 days. Most people can't do a 40-day fast. It's, it's not easy. And he says, he, he points at the, the stones and he says, if, if you are the son of God, turn those, those stones into, into bread. And we know how Jesus handled that by quoting the word of God. So again, the enemy, the very first arrow that he shoots at our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is this arrow of rejection and insecurity. And so here's what I want to point out is uh, I'm gonna go all the way back and show you really how deadly this can be because obviously if it has the potential to rob us of our destiny, we need to understand how this works and how to overcome it. I went to uh, a coaching school, some of you know this, I, I am a certified professional coach. And I, I do it more for ministry purposes more so than as, any, as a lifestyle or uh, for monetary reasons. But the majority of the people that I was in this coaching school with had at least a master's degree, if not a PhD. And one of the exercises that they made us do was the gremlin exercise. And the gremlin exercise was you had to create an image or something that, that symbolized your gremlin. And now let me explain what the gremlin one. Remember that maybe the gremlins, they're these ugly little creatures. <laughs> so a gremlin was this voice that we have inside of us and they told us, and this was a newsflash to me, that every one of us has a little voice inside of us that tells us that we're not good enough. So there's always gonna be this little thing that says, oh, you're not good enough to do that. You're not good enough. They're not gonna like you because of fill in the blank. They're not, yeah, they, of course you can't be a part of that because of whatever. You know, sometimes you, you might have gone to church as a kid and felt like you weren't good enough to be in church because you didn't know the Bible well enough or you didn't, you know, you're. Maybe your parents weren't Christians or, or something. A lot of people had this gremlin if they were raised in a one-parent uh, family. But even those of us who had two parents raising us still experienced rejection and, and, and heartache and um, disappointment just like other people did. So here's what I want to point out. is um, I'm going to actually read a passage for you from the Bible. And this is because this is such a good story. Now, this is the story about Saul. Saul is the first king of Israel. If you go back and you look at the book of Samuel, now Samuel was a prophet that was, God would use, remember God was, when he brought the, the Israelite people out of Egypt, out of captivity, he was led by Moses and, it, and, then, and then Joshua took over. But he was always, they were always led by a man of God and they were the mouthpiece of God to the people. Good morning. <laughs> and they were, so they were always being led by this. Well, the people, uh, while they were um, being led by Samuel, at one point said, we want a king, we want a king. And Samuel, you know, this kind of really upset him because he's the one that was the mouthpiece from God to, to them and God was their king. And he said, okay, well, don't, don't be upset with the people because they're not rejecting you, but they're rejecting me. And if they want a king, then fine, Why, what, we'll give them a king. <laughs> and so he has him appoint or anoint uh, Saul to be the first king. Saul was only about 30 years old. Now, Saul was not really somebody that was well known. Um, it sounds like he was probably a nice looking guy. They were happy that you know they had this king because they felt protected by having a king because all the other nations around them had a king. Now they felt like, okay, now we can be known as having a king. Okay, God really did not want to do this. But like I said, the people cried out and Samuel responded, by giving them a king. Well, here's the thing: as we go, as we get into the story, um, one of the early battles that that God tells them. Now, kings are supposed to lead their people, um, their their soldiers, into battle to take territory, and he has he tells Saul through Samuel. Samuel is the prophet, so all this time Saul is getting his. He's still getting his advice through Samuel the prophet. So it's not like Samuel's not still on the scene. He is. 
and things are still happening through Samuel, but it's like he's telling Saul, okay, God said to go take out the Malachites. And take them all out, wipe them all out, don't leave anything, nothing, nothing left, left behind. <laughs> And then he gets a dream in the night, and, and, and basically God is telling Samuel, uh, I'm not pleased with him, because he's not obeying me. And so he goes to meet uh, Samuel, uh, to meet King Saul the next morning, and, and, and King Saul, and when he goes to look for him, they're like, oh, he's not even here. He went to go build a monument for himself, because he feels like he was victorious, because he obeyed God. And so here comes Samuel, and he's like, hey, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and really... He, what, what King Saul doesn't know is that Samuel, the prophet, had been up all night uh, contending with God and grieving with God and, and praying, I mean, all night long this had gone on. And, and, and King Saul's like, well, yes, I obeyed the Lord and, and we, we had great success. Well, it's true, he had great success, but he had brought some things back with him. He didn't kill everything off. And the prophet Samuel, he says, well, what is that bleeding that I hear in my ear? He's talking about, you know, sheep. Ah, ah, that's the bleeding. <laughs> the bleating uh, of sheep in my ear. And he's like, oh, well, the soldiers wanted to take, bring back the best. You know, they brought best, back, back the best cattle. They brought back the best sheep so that they could offer them up to the Lord. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's like... And that's not what you were supposed to do. You didn't obey God. And he's like, yeah, I did. You know, we, we, the Lord told us to, to go take out the Amalekites. We did. I brought back King Agai. And put on the brakes. Okay, you brought back the king alive? You brought back King Agai alive? Okay, so now we know the king, the king is still alive. So he brought back King uh, Agai alive. We don't really know why, I guess as a trophy or something, and he allowed his soldiers to bring back uh, the best sheep and the best cattle. Okay, this is not what, you know, partial obedience is not obedience, okay? <laughs> this is important to know, because sometimes we think, oh yeah, well I did what God told me to do, but sometimes we didn't do all of what God told us to do, and it can be uh, detrimental. And <laughs> God is not happy, and uh, Samuel, the prophet, is not happy with this. So I'm going to pick up this story here. And um, and this is, I think I've talked about this before. He said, um, go and, uh, Samuel said, although you were once small in your, uh, uh, this is the prophet speaking, Samuel. He said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you the king over Israel and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Uh, why, did you not pounce, why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? And again, this is where King Saul says, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely removed the Amalekites and brought back Agai, their king. The, the soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder and the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice. But Samuel replies and says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of divination. Remember, the sin of divination is witchcraft. And arrogance, like the evil of idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as the king. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instruction. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Here's, here's the key here, is in his insecurity, he gave in to the people. He cared more about what the people thought of him than what God thought. And herein lies the arrow of insecurity. So here's what I want to point out is, from here on out, now God is going to send Samuel on a, a trip to go anoint who will be the next king, which we know becomes David. And so let's look at the difference between David and, and Samuel. Samuel, uh, I mean Saul, I'm sorry, King Saul is constantly going back to Samuel and, and seeking his advice. Now this isn't abnormal for a king. This is There was a balance of power, but the difference was is Saul did not have a developed 
um, intimate relationship with the Lord like King David ended up having. Even from a young age, David had a very intimate relationship. Remember, God said, I'm going to seek out a man who has a heart after me. Well, David, because he had been out in the field uh, with the sheep and playing his, playing his harp, he had tapped into something inadvertently. He had tapped into how to, how to usher in the presence of God and therefore created a, a love and intimate relationship with the Lord. So he knew how to seek the Lord for himself. So you see throughout the rest of the history of David where many times when his back was against the wall or he got himself in a situation or there was trouble where he inquired of the Lord. He went before God and he sought God for himself. Okay, so his security was in God and he didn't have this issue that, that King Saul had. King Saul was so desperate uh, and, and not knowing how to seek God for himself that at one point after the prophet Samuel is dead, he goes to a witch, he goes to a medium. Even though he had cast them out of the country, he goes and he, he secretly finds a witch, uh, uh, the witch of Endora, I think it was Endora, and he, he asks her to bring up the spirit of Samuel because he doesn't know what to do. Okay, that, that just goes to show you the, how important it is for us, each individually, to seek God for ourselves. So many times we go and we, we hunt down church services or prophets or other people and say, give me a word, I want a word from God. You know, and it's not, uh, there's nothing wrong with God speaking through someone, but we have to be able to hear God for ourselves. And the only way we're gonna be able to hear God for ourselves is by developing an intimate walk with the Lord um, through through time. I mean, think about it. If you wanted to develop an intimate relationship with another person, say you started dating somebody and you uh, got it, you were moving towards marriage. It, it there is without it necessarily being sexual. There there becomes an intimacy because you're spending time with that person. The same thing is true of our Lord and Savior, as He wants to have time with you and I. Think of the in the Garden of uh, of Eden when He created Adam and Eve. It's that he wanted a, a relationship. He liked walking in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And God wants to have an intimate relationship with you and I. But I can't do that for you. Um, uh, somebody, some your pastor can't do that for you. A prophet can't do that for you. Only you can do that for yourself. And this is really, oh, I don't have time to get into that. Um, <laughs> This, this is where the anointing comes from. And so if you do nothing else but do exactly what David is, did and usher in the presence of God through praise and worship, uh, he would play the harp. Now, I don't know how to play the harp and I'm not really very good at singing, <laughs> but um, what I can do is I can turn on some praise and worship music, uh, some Michael W. Smith, K Carrie Job, something, and, and just ask God, God, I just, I just, uh, you know, invite you into this moment. I invite you here today and just open it up. Just say, God, I invite you. God, I want to have this time with you. I want to hear from you. I want to talk to you and sit down with your Bible and, 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 and a journal or note cards, whatever you need. And, and just be prepared to hear and pray over your Bible. I just say, God, make your word come to life for me. Because sometimes you're reading the Bible and it's just, it, it just seems like words that sometimes it feels dry to you. But you know what? God's word is life. And he breathed his breath on paper. This, this is his word it is, is him. And we can have our intimate relationship with the Lord by inviting him in, uh, a lot of times through praise and worship, and then sitting down with our Bible and just waiting to hear what he has to say. And you know what? There's no right or wrong on how to do this. If you have a prayer journal, which is just a little notebook, something to write in, you write down what you think you're hearing. And as time goes by, this will get easier. And, you know, I, as a kid, I used to just write out, you know, what I thought, which was, thank you, God. As I'd start writing, I'd be, thank you, God, um, for a good day today. Thank you, God, for giving me my dog. Thank you, God, that, you know, my parents are getting along. Whatever it was, it was simple little prayers. But if I look back at those old prayer journals, it's a lot of thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And at first, I'll be honest with you, I stopped journaling because I thought, well, this is dumb. All I'm doing is saying thank you. <laughs> I didn't understand the power of gratitude. 
gratitude is it is a good thing. It, it is a very good thing because if you look at the examples uh, of the Israelites and how many times that they fell into rebellion, a lot of it revolved around their grumbling and complaining against God. So uh, the opposite would be gratitude and being thankful for even the smallest things. So if all you're doing is saying thank you, thank you God, it just sounds like a little bit like a diary, but as you open your heart to hear from God, uh, just allow, just God, what do you want to say to me? And it's usually it's impressions. Sometimes you'll see a picture in your mind. Sometimes you'll just hear a little voice. Whatever it is, just write it down. There, again, there's no right or wrong to this. Nobody's going to see it but you. But you're developing an intimate relationship with the Lord. And so when you are in a squeeze or in a pinch and there's things that you have to make decisions about, you can go before the Lord and say, God, I really... I need some help with this. I don't know what to do. God, I, I want to do this in a way that pleases you, but God, I have to hear from you. And only you can do that through the relationship you have with the Lord. And as this relationship grows, you'll feel more secure, more solid, more sure of who you are. You will start to recognize that you're not an orphan, that you're a child of God, and God wants to have a relationship with you. And here's the thing I love about God is his love is everlasting. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So those arrows of insecurity, when people reject us, when people turn their back on us, when somebody breaks up with you, when somebody tells you, uh, shoots an arrow at your integrity, you know what? Okay, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but I know who I am in Christ and I can rest assured in the security of who God says that I am. And even though I might mess up, I can still come back to the Lord and say, God, I messed this up, but I know that you still love me because your love is unfailing. Over and over again, the Bible talks about the unfailing love of God. And that unfailing love is for you and I. So I want you to rest in that and I want you to be able to, to hold up the shield of faith and just cause that arrow of insecurity to bounce off of you. And so when the enemy tries to come at you and says, you know when you did that, you know, you know, you know when you were mean to that person, you know when you were you stole so-and-so's boyfriend, you know, and you know what, you can't go to church, nobody's gonna accept you, you're not good enough, whatever it is that the enemy tries to play pray on you. Even it might be people that say this. You know what? You can say, thank you, God, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price for my sin. God, I thank you that I, I, have, I have come into a place of submission to you, God. I trust you, God, that you have a good and awesome plan for my life, and you have not given me a spirit of fear but of a sound mind, self-control, and of power. And I thank you that my security is in you, that I can walk securely before you because I know who I am in you. So I, I need to, <laughs> I've probably gone over my time, but I encourage you to ask the Lord um, how he sees you. Just, just sit there with your notebook and just say, God, how do you see me? Because God, how you see me is important to me. And just wait and allow the Lord to give you a picture in your, in, in your mind of how he sees you and you'll see just how, how special and beautiful you are in his eyes and I believe that will give you the encouragement and the strength to move past the things the lies of the enemy so father God we just thank you and we praise you that you are the king of kings and the lord of lords God I thank you that you are giving us a picture of who we are in you father God God I thank you I thank you father God that you cover us uh, you shield us in, in the shadow of your wing, Father God. God, I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every person here today. God, I speak a blessing over them. We cancel any and all orders and plans of Satan and his wicked spirits that would try to rob us of the will of God today. We choose to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and we pull down all strongholds in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father God, that you are renewing our, our mind, that you're giving us a new picture of ourselves and that we can put our rest and our trust in you knowing that you are more than able to do far exceedingly above and beyond anything we could think, ask, or hope for. Know that I love you, but more importantly, God loves you. And he has a good and awesome plan for your life, plans to bless you and plans to prosper you. I hope you have a great weekend. I will see you tomorrow when we talk about the arrow of seduction. Love you.